coming up on episode one of Omnivore. Fresh data on salary and career trends in the science of food. A conversation with the legendary Michael Eskin. Plus, the impact of race in science. All that and more. This is Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's new concierge membership. Accelerate your product development and innovate faster with a concierge membership. Find out more at ift.org slash membership. Welcome to Omnivore, a new podcast from the editors of Food Technology Magazine, where we'll explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm your host, Bill McDowell, and today we're kicking off this new podcast with some fresh research on compensation and career trends in the science of food. According to the 2022 IFT Employment and Salary Survey, professionals in the science of food are clearly in the driver's seat. Median salaries jumped nearly 16% from 2019 to reach $110,000. But despite these gains, gender and race-based salary gaps still exist. And even with pay bumps, salaries can't keep up with the current inflation rates. Food Technology's Deputy Managing Editor, Kelly Hensel, recently sat down with the magazine's executive editor, Mary Ellen Kuhn, to discuss the findings of this year's salary survey, and what implications it may have for the profession overall. Tell us a little bit about the compensation research that IFT conducted earlier this year. Well, for many years, IFT surveyed science food professionals about salaries and benefits, and we've been reporting on it in food technology. In fact, this is something that IFT has been doing since 1966. In the magazine, it's always one of our more popular features. Most people are curious about what other people make. How does my salary match up? That sort of thing. So it's a big survey, and it was conducted by a professional research firm via email. This year, we had about 3,000 respondents. Let's get to the numbers. What did this year's survey show about salaries? Well, salaries shot up by 16% to a median salary of $110,000, and that's the biggest jump in 20 years. It was exciting news, but maybe not totally unexpected, given what's been happening in the job market. After all, we've all heard about the great resignation and how tight the job market is and how job seekers have benefited. It's been a candidate's market for sure. The survey showed that a quarter of our respondents had pursued a job change within the past 24 months. And as part of my research for the article, I talked to recruiters and they told me that talent acquisition has been a huge challenge. And I asked about who was most in demand and the answer I got was was that that person was someone with a master's degree in food science and maybe about five to seven years of experience and somebody who was ambitious enough and ready to move up the ladder. Recruiters just can't find enough of those kinds of candidates. And we found this year in the survey too that starting salaries were very strong. Now this was from a relatively small pool of about 3% of the respondents who had less than one year of experience, but their salaries shot up by 33% to $77,000. Meanwhile, though, I've seen some research from executive recruiting firm Opus International, which tracks the number of food science majors in their senior year at colleges and universities. And that number was down in 2022. So that could contribute, I suppose, to the potential for a a shortage of talent. So the market continues to be quite competitive. And of course, the current economic climate may take a toll. The experts I talk to, though, say that the field tends to be pretty recession-proof. After all, everybody eats. So who earns the most? Well, this isn't too surprising. As you might expect, company presidents, partners, owners, and other top managerial roles have the highest salaries. But in terms of specific positions in the R&D, scientific, technical category, flavors always seem to come out near the top. And that was true this year, too. Flavors had a median salary of $141,000. And other highly paid positions include product managers and food engineers. 
And in terms of academic degrees that the survey tracked, those with MBAs tend to be the highest paid. The median salary for MBA recipients who are working in the science of food profession has surged by 20% since 2017, and that's up to over $143,000. The research also breaks out salaries geographically, and this year the science of food professionals in the South Atlantic region, and that extends from Maryland to Florida, were the highest paid. They had a median salary of $121,500, and they edged out the mid-Atlantic region, which was tops in the 2019 survey. That's interesting. I, I love that flavorists are up there, man. They they have a lot of they have a every, lot of things to to learn in order to become a flavorist. So it makes sense. Every, um, year, every year that's the same. Yeah, is it? Okay. <laughs> Pretty consistent, I would say. All right. Given the great resignation or the great reevaluation, as some have dubbed it, how has the employment landscape changed? Well, I think the biggest changes probably go back to the fact that it truly is a candidate's market. So if you were a job seeker, you could sometimes call the shots. Recruiters told me that many candidates just will not relocate for a job, and that can make it hard for employers. There's also a greater expectation of being able to work at home, at least some of the time, sometimes even for people who might be working in a lab in quality assurance, for example. And this isn't from our survey, but I thought it was interesting. A study by ADP found that almost two-thirds of the workforce that they surveyed earlier this year. So they would think about looking for a new job if they were required to work in the office full time. Now in the IFT survey, respondents work from home an average of just under two days a week. Of course that varied. 18% of the respondents said they were fully remote, but more than a third said that they didn't work from home at all. And for our final question, I know that IFT and food technology have tracked the gender salary gap for many years. What did this year's survey show? Yes, there's still a gender gap in salaries with women earning significantly less than men, 21% less according to the survey. So while the median survey for women was $100,000, for men it was almost $126,000. That really aligns with figures across the board. An expert on the gender salary gap that I interviewed for the article told me that in general, women's salaries are about 80% of men's salaries. Things have gotten better since the 1960s when, and I'm speaking in general terms here, not about food science specifically, but since the 1960s when women made about 60% of what men earned. And the salary gap has narrowed quite a bit over the next couple of decades after the 1960s, but it's stalled and it's been stuck at that 80% range or so for the past, about the past decade. But if there is some good news in this area of the IFT survey, it's that this year's gap between men and women's salaries was smaller than it was in the 2019 survey. And it matched the smallest gap that we ever identified in the IFT research, which was in 2005, when it was also a 21% gap. I'd also like to mention that this year, the research also compared salaries by race. And here's what that showed. Black science of food professionals earned 9% less than whites. Asians earned 3% less. And the pay gap between whites and Latinx professionals disappeared this year. Both of those cohorts earned the same. Mary Ellen Kuhn is executive editor of Food Technology Magazine. The 2022 IFT Compensation and Career Path Report is available for free to IFT members and for purchase by non-members. You can learn more about the 2022 report and read analysis from food technology by visiting ift.org slash salary survey. Each episode of Omnivore, Food Technology Associate Editor Emily Little shares news and statistics from around the food industry. In today's segment, she discusses two recent stories, one regarding food insecurity in the United States and one on consumers' favorite ice cream flavors. Hello everyone, I am Emily Little, Associate Editor with Food Technology Magazine. And I want to share some interesting news items that I have found in my research. The first one has to do with food insecurity in the United States. 
Feeding America released their annual Map the Meal Gap report. And according to this year's report, every county and congressional district in the United States is experiencing some level of food insecurity. Now, there's a pretty big range in terms of this insecurity. For example, Bowman County, North Dakota, is only experiencing a rate of 3% of food insecurity, while Presidio County, Texas, is up to 46%. So while there is a gap, it is concerning to the researchers at Feeding America that we are now seeing this everywhere. Now, the USDA defines food insecurity as, quote, the lack of access to enough food for an active, healthy life, end quote. And Feeding America releases this report every year to try to find the areas where food insecurity is the most dire and figure out how we can get resources to those areas. Further, according to the report, eight of the 10 counties with the highest level of food insecurity were located in the South. This includes Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Louisiana. And in addition to that, Food insecurity rates were higher among Black and Latinx individuals than their white counterparts in 99% of the counties. And child food insecurity rates were as high as 40% in some areas. The report does explain that some of these statistics are lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, and Feeding America ends their report with some policy recommendations for strengthening federal food systems and bolstering child nutrition programs. On to my next piece of news. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Well, the International Dairy Foods Association wants to find out. They polled ice cream makers, scoop shops, and consumers from all over the United States about their favorite flavors. And what I found really interesting was that there were different top flavors between ice cream manufacturers and consumers. So let's break it down. Among ice cream manufacturers and scoop shops, cookies and cream is the top flavor, followed by vanilla, chocolate, mint chocolate chip, and strawberry. Now, among consumers, the flavors are mostly the same, just in a different order. So consumers, top flavor is chocolate, followed by cookies and cream, vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate chip. How does your favorite measure up against that? The survey didn't just show favorite flavors of ice cream, but how people like to eat their ice cream. For example, waffle cones are more popular than sugar cones, but over a third of consumers actually prefer to eat their ice cream out of a bowl. When it came to toppings, chocolate and caramel were the most popular sauce-based toppings, and nuts and sprinkles were the most popular dry toppings. That's all for the news this time. I'm Emily Little, and I'll talk to you next time. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. IFT's new concierge membership is available to help your R&D, product development, and innovation teams move faster. Get access to an IFT technical concierge. From curated research to expert connections, you ask, we answer. And all activities are strictly confidential. Learn more about IFT's concierge membership at ift.org slash membership. Welcome back to Omnivore, I'm Bill McDowell. Although Michael Eskin is best known for his work in edible oils and his key role in the development of canola oil, he's also gained notoriety in some circles as a rap artist, praised for his good flow and laser sharp lipid science lexicon. Food technology science and technology editor, Julie Larson Brisher, recently chatted with the noted biochemist about winning IFT's 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award in honor of Nicholas Appere, as well as Eskin's side gig as a food science rapper. Well, you know, Michael, congratulations again on being awarded this year's IFT Lifetime Achievement Award in honor of Nicholas Appere. It, it was well deserved. And um, uh, let's talk a little bit about what does that award mean to you? Well, I mean, it really is um, 
reflects a long, <laughs> many years of um, research and writing. And um, one doesn't, when one, when one does this, one is really has no idea of what, what will come. You know, you're doing the various projects, etc. So having this award is really, um, as I said, it's like the icing on the cake. I got several other awards from IFT, but this one is the, if you like, the pièce de résistance. It's the the uh, the ultimate one, and for that I'm I'm extremely grateful because I know there's such outstanding people out there, and. Um, to get this award is certainly, um, uh, uh, for me, quite an accomplishment. Yeah, you're, you're part of an elite club now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let's let's talk, let's rap about rap. Mm. You know, uh, many of your colleagues and your students uh, around the world know that you're recognized for using rap music to teach and communicate food science concepts. Um, you also have a YouTube channel, you have press CDs. So you've been out there with this style of music, although I know that you sort of grew up um, singing your, in your life. Um, tell me, how did you get started behind the mic? And what do you like most about composing or performing this type of music? Well, I, interesting you should say that because um uh, in my hometown in Birmingham, there was a famous um, biochemist, Harold Baum, uh, and uh, he was a professor at, uh, in, in London, and he used to write ditties for his colleagues at the end of the year uh, for a Christmas celebration. And he had a book called The Biochemical Songbook. And I always said to my colleagues, you know, you should use that songbook because there's nothing worth in an examination when you have this sterile environment that's very tense. It's much better if you have students sitting and answering the exam and everybody's humming and you have this wonderful lilting melody that is much more relaxing. And secondly, people will remember things much better by music than, by, than, than uh, just by rote. And, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, and I... I, I uh, sort of did something called 10 ways to better organize the university and one of the things I said they should um, combine chemistry with music and uh, you, and you could have this sort of um, nice combination. Someone said to combine uh, music with the, with the faculty of uh, education you have the faculty of ABCs and do re mis. <laughs> 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 well, of all of the songs, now, how did you actually get started um, recording like CDs or putting stuff on YouTube? Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, I was a soloist in choirs and it goes back, you know, when I was in England in the I. Stedford concert, etc. So I was always used to, um, to, to performing. So, and... <clears throat> And I sort of had performed quite a lot for folk and and uh, and cantorial, so I I was familiar. As my mother said, I'm a real ham when I get up there. And um, uh, so it, I was thinking of some, uh, doing a project, and so I started writing something on the on the the genesis. And I looked at that and said, read it. It's not much better if it went for music. And so I put it to music, and on the last one was what they called the Passover rap. And the university heard it, and they thought they really liked it. So they took me on campus, and they recorded it and made a video and put it on YouTube. So that was really how that started. And then the um, American Oil Chemist Society wanted a, a, um, a poster on education. So I thought, well, I don't want to do something that's just standard so I really lippies get a bad rap it isn't fair and I you know so that really started me on and I've already and I've done a writing for I did something for Sesame Street Canada and I'm always writing something and um, because I I used to say to my colleagues you get too serious you just got to relax and take it easy because you know life is too short to be not to have fun some sort of fun and um, so that really um, 
uh, started the whole thing. And um, and once you get started on that, then I'm looking, well, what's the next thing to do? So uh, that fatty acids and became the fats, fat soluble vitamins. And now I have the protein one. Right. You know, uh, well, and I've listened to the to the lipids one several times now on YouTube and your, your very first one there. And um, is that one of your favorites or, or which ones have been among, I know you've composed a lot of songs outside of the rap style. I think that is my favorite because, you know, it deals with issues like, you know, cholesterol is, is, you know, such a down molecule, yet it's so important. I mean, it does play a role in, in the whole range, besides the he- sex hormones that people would often eat, obviously don't, don't want to have around. Uh, the, it's digestion. It, it's, you know, so it's much maligned and people forget how important it is in our metabolism. All the cell walls have cholesterol in in, in the uh, cell membranes. It's everywhere. It's so important. It's um, vitamin D <laughs> comes. Yeah. It, so it's really important. And so when, when there's an over, you know, there's a tendency to demonize something that really shouldn't be demonized, put into the context, because everything is safe. At a, ter- at a certain level, you can drown in water. So you know, everything is has a um, a safety margin to it, and uh, you go excess or less, then you're in danger zone. Right now, can't you want to sing me a few bars from that? Uh, from that, lipids get a bad rap. I love I just- it. I'm not sure I have that one. In, oh, in, well, no. what what do you have? <laughs> I have one that I, I tease my um, uh, my colleagues on sensory evaluation. <laughs> so I did that song to um, supercalifragilistic. So sensory evaluation or galacticaliosis is the only way to test your product's profileosis. Just take a bite and tell me if it's quite atrocious using sensory evaluation or organoleptic analysis. Num de little little um delight, um de little little um delight. Sensory evaluation, organoleptic analysis. Once you're in a panel, there's no escapiosis. Your your taste and smell will undergo a metamorphosis using sensory evaluation, organoleptic analysis. <laughs> I love it, Michael. <laughs> You know, it really is a great way to communicate these science concepts. You know. Do you have any others you want to sing for us? Well, I once did a performance call to the joint meeting of the serial chemists, and um, and I uh, wanted to t- really to tease them and to use all the scientific terminology, sort of like um, dough and gluten and and you know instead of puppy loves puppy loaves, which they they generally make these small loaves too. So I'll, and this was done. Um, you you guess the song, serial chemists research on bread, but they could make much more dough if, like Marie Antoinette said, bake cakes instead. They're totally stuck on glutenin and dot on puppy loaves, which is rather a sin. Serial chemists said, please do not sneer. All they want is their loaf and a bottle of beer. (laughs) (laughs) So we we had a lot of fun (laughs) <laughs> with that one so <laughs> well thanks michael it's been great talking to you today and as always i will look forward to our your next youtube video <laughs> so do i i'm waiting for my son to finish the music on that <laughs> i may send him this podcast as a reminder <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Michael Eskin is now in his 55th year of teaching and research at the University of Manitoba. You can read Julie's extended interview with him in the October issue of Food Technology. To experience his flow firsthand, search for Michael Eskin Lipids Wrap on YouTube. By definition, sound science should be driven by objective facts and unbiased data. But in a recent essay, microbiologist Larry Keener says that career opportunities in food science are still being hindered by social biases. We recently met up to discuss the impact of race throughout the science of food. So your recent essay really challenges this whole notion of science being a pure meritocracy. Uh, you say that without diversity and inclusion, meritocracy itself is a meaningless myth. What's your core message to your peers? So science is very demanding. And my experience suggests that the more brain power that we can bring to the bench, the better off we will be in our effort to be successful solving that problem. And, you know, I think diversity or I know from experience that diversity is potentially a very powerful tool. Yes, a very powerful tool. Even, even in science, our experiences, both as professionals and our personal experiences, matter. You know, what I know about a problem and what I think about solving a problem is likely to be different than what another investigator might understand about the same problem. Therein lies the power. You know, just to put a fine point on it, you know, I've been doing this food safety for almost 40 years. And one of the first things that we're taught is that in order to do this right, to do food safety the right way, you need a multidisciplinary team. That is, you need diversity. You need food scientists, you need microbiologists, you might need virologists, process engineering. You need a diverse team in order to be successful. Now, Bill, that's 101A food safety. So the power of diversity is understood in the sciences. It's not always applied. You've experienced a lot of this firsthand in the, in the essay you wrote that one of your academic advisors described you pursuing a degree in science as a black man as socially deviant behavior. And yet you've gone on to have a very successful career. So was there a particular breakthrough moment for you personally? Yeah, I'll share with you one that, you know, has stuck with me for a long, long, long time. And I say a long, long time because it occurred at about 1964. And I was a 10th grader and I had enrolled in an advanced biology class. And, you know, after being enrolled, I was summoned to the guidance counselor's office. And she sat down and, and uh, sat across the table from me and said, well, you know, Larry, I really think that you should take general biology. This advanced biology class is, is probably going to be too hard. And I, it took my breath away, actually, um, because at that time, I was very, a very, very good science student. And I um, presented the these facts to the lady and she already had the grades. She already had the records. So she already knew that I was a good science student, uh, but she was adamant that I should take this general biology class. And I, I left there without 
giving her a yay or a nay. And I stayed in the class, but I did, I went and sought counsel from my high school, my junior high school science instructors. And when I sat um, and put forth this story to the, the one instructor that I had a great relationship with, his reaction was visceral. His face turned bright red, and he says, well, Larry, of course you should take that advanced class. And I did. Now, that, that story, that, that circumstance, you know, it stuck with me for a long time, and, and it's, a, it's a painful episode for me, and that's, that's why it, I think that's why it, it, it hangs around. This, is, this was kind of a breakthrough moment for me that if I was going to ever become a scientist, then I had to understand that there were some obstacles along the way, and I needed to be prepared to face those challenges and to surmount those difficulties where I could. So given the benefit of that experience and that perspective, what message either of encouragement or warning would you give to a student or a young scientist of color who is just entering the profession? What I have to say first and foremost is be true to the science first and foremost. And what I mean by that is, you know, don't be afraid to do the hard work uh, that is required. And when you do that, also be amazed at where the science might take you. Uh, you know, I've, I never could conceive or would have conceived that I've had the great experiences that I've, uh, I've had as a result of, of my passion for microbiology, but it's real. And the next thing I would say, and I do say, is refuse to be invisible. You know, the, the, the author Ralph Ellison wrote, we are invisible because they refuse to see us. And I say, make your presence known. Don't be afraid to raise your hand and don't be afraid to stand up and don't be afraid to speak up. What you have to say is important. What you have to say might be uh, the key to solving a difficult problem. Your, your, your voice might be um, the breakthrough for the next great uh, scientific discovery. Don't be invisible. Outstanding. Larry Keener is president and CEO of International Product Safety Consultants, and an internationally recognized microbiologist. You can read his full essay in the November issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT's new concierge membership. Accelerate your product development and innovate faster with an IFT concierge membership. Find out more at ift.org slash membership. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all of our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussions about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore. <laughs>